Thanks. I just had uh, some connection issues on my end. So please give a holler um, if things start to get choppy, if you can't hear me. And in fact, can someone just verify that uh, they can hear me right now and everything is is good? We can hear you. All right. Good to know. Um, yeah, besides that and possible wailing of a small cat in the background, we should be good. This classic Zoom scenario here. But um, yeah, my name is Dominic Vaz. I'm the Assistant Director of Fair Housing. Like Catherine said, at Open Communities, we're a 50-year-old fair housing organization that's been um, you know, working to eradicate discrimination in all its forms um, for many years and doing that in a lot of different ways. Um, I'll do a little introduction uh, to what we do, the services that we offer, and then we'll kind of do some, some high-level overviews of what fair housing means, um, a little bit, a tiny snippet of history from the Fair Housing Act, uh, a little a little deep dive into disability and just sort of um, uh, kind of squaring away what are the what are the rights that we have from the federal, state, and local level um, that are available to us through civil rights law and through um, you know hard fought wins from from civil rights groups and um, community members all over the country. So um, it's a topic we hold very dear, and we're glad to be sharing with you tonight. So Claire, you can go ahead and move slides. So that, that's fine. The last slide was just a little, you know, we have a, a disclaimer that uh, we're funded by HUD, uh, it's Department of Housing and Urban Development, and this presentation doesn't necessarily reflect the views of HUD and their programming is dedicated to the public. Um, so this is a little bit about open communities and what we do. Um, this has kind of varied a little bit over the years as the programs change. You know, like I said, it's a fairly old organization, but we've always been involved in some way or another in doing fair housing, um, kind of what we think of tr as traditional fair housing work. So that means, um, you know, investigating and enforcing cases of discrimination where folks have violated civil rights laws. That can look like filing complaints, uh, connecting folks with legal resources, um, you know, sending demand letters that illegal action cease on the part of a, a housing provider or another entity um, or on behalf of a, of a tenant usually, but to a housing provider or other entity. And um, we also assist folks with disabilities with reasonable accommodations and modifications. I'll talk about what those mean if you're not familiar. And we do education like we're doing today and, and other types of events. We have another department um, in our organization of really great folks that do housing counseling. That work can be um, a variety of things. It can be um, broad kind of financial literacy, so folks can learn how to budget, um, so folks can maybe prepare to be first-time home buyers. Um, it also can be coaching, you know, with folks who are older. Maybe they're trying to age in place, or maybe they're actually facing a loss and are facing foreclosure, and we can help them kind of mitigate that loss. So they're really kind of experts on mortgages and navigating that whole system and and um, th those financial components. So yeah, you can move forward. So a little bit about us. So we just like to, at the beginning of our presentations, just sort of affirm for you all that we really believe that education flows uh, both ways in these kinds of um, presentations. So at the end, there'll be room to kind of share any stories, questions, experiences that you've had. Um, there's a lot that we learn from participants that come to our workshop. So please do share and ask questions. Another thing we you know, want to just sort of uh, acknowledge is that we're talking about um, discrimination in housing, which you know can can be traumatizing for folks. And if folks here have faced any discrimination, um, you know you'll you'll know that, of course. And we just want to recognize that uh, we're here to make the space feel um, you know safe and affirming, and and give you kind of um, the facts to to arm you against um, you know being able to take action against these kinds of. Um, behaviors and um, illegal prohibited acts that we're going to be talking about. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So start us off, I'm going to talk about what is fair housing. Um, we were just talking to a group um, giving this presentation the other day, and I was reflecting on, you know, when I started in, in fair housing, I didn't exactly know what it meant. I knew that there's housing justice, I, I was aware of, you know, housing policy advocacy, advocating for more affordable housing, advocating for tenants rights, and, and these types of things. And I didn't know quite what was distinct about fair housing. And I soon learned that it really has to do with civil rights. Um, and civil rights really have to do with discrimination and making sure that um, people have the right to live where they choose. When housing is fair, people have that ability. They also have um, the ability to use their homes 
um, and have the full use of their homes. It's especially true folks with disabilities that oftentimes because of um, you know different needs, you know, need some kind of accommodations to fully enjoy their homes. But it's the enjoyment of that without having to experience discrimination or harassment uh, or coercion. And the sort of um, bedrock of all this is, is Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, better known as the Fair Housing Act. And this was passed about a week after the assassination of, of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I encourage everybody here, um, if you haven't seen it, it's about it's less than a 10 minute um, kind of miniature documentary called Seven Days, which is produced by the National Fair Housing Alliance that goes through the passage of the Fair Housing Act and how what a, a, a rot time it was for the country and our fraught, I think I should say, um, fraught time for the country. And, um, you know, that the, the act really passed because of, of of that tragedy it was sort of stuck in Congress, but um, you know it eventually got passed with some pressure from the president and others, uh, as Lyndon B. Johnson at the time, and and it um, you know it set the ground floor for um, prohibiting discrimination um, in private housing. There had been efforts to already ban that kind of discrimination where uh, the federal government was involved, but this was sort of a new realm, and um, we've made a lot of progress since then. But sometimes discrimination just changes forms and we have to be vigilant and we'll talk about um, what kind of new protections there are in addition from the ones that were passed in the original act um, here next and go to the next slide. Um, and so I know I'm going through a lot of this stuff quickly and it looks like we got the registration questions just popped up on my screen. Did that happen for other folks just now or was that late for me just because my connection is funky? I just started the poll and I, I, for those who weren't here in the beginning, I put some explanation in the chat for what the poll is. And should we, should we, should I take a minute and pause just so folks have some, some uh, yeah. ability to on that? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, Thank so you. Me, just a couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. Let's take pause for a couple minutes and um, fill out those questions again. It is anonymous and optional. It just helps for our grant reporting purposes to know who's kind of coming to our training. So thank you for, um, your attention on the poll. Okay, I ended poll. Thank you for those who participated. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, so when the original act was passed in 1968, we had actually four federally protected classes and it eventually expanded through amendments of the federal law to seven um, that we've had ever since the late 80s. So the original four were race, color, national origin, and religion. So numbers one through three and number five. Um, in the 1970s, uh, I think in 74, we added sex, and I believe in 1988, we added disability and familial status. So some of these are kind of obvious. Um, race and color, even though they're, you know, race might be a complex topic sort of philosophically, we generally know what racial discrimination looks like on the ground. And, um, you know, we don't need too much explanation on that. Probably national origin uh, under the language of the Fair Housing Act and similar laws is a little bit um less obvious. It, of course, can mean the nation of your origin, where you were born. Um, it can also mean your immigration status, because that's very closely linked to, of course, your nation of origin. It can mean the language that you're speaking and your ethnicity. It can mean your ancestry as well, um, you know, the, the birthplace of your parents and your parents' parents and so on, your lineage, so to speak. And um, so that's kind of a little bit of a broader uh, protection. Sex, number four, is also a bit broader uh, due to a Supreme Court action in 2020 that expanded the federal government's um, definition of sex in, in many contexts to include not just sort of a binary idea of male and female, but also to include gender identity and sexual orientation in those protections. So folks that identify um, as lesbian, gay, queer, who are facing discrimination due to that identity um, can seek um, remedies under the law, um, as well as folks who identify as uh, trans or any other sort of um, gender expansive identities um, have some protections there now. So that's sort of a, a, a the way that HUD, after that ruling in 2021, said, well, we are interpreting the law this way now because of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, I think the reality is, you know, that's a uh, an interpretation that's legally defended by the government, but these things, um, given some of the current court system structures, um, you know, hopefully they don't change in the future, but um, we got to kind of fight to, to maintain these rights for folks. So um, religion, fairly um, uh, obvious. Disability, we're going to dive into. 
And just another note here, number seven, familial status. This just means the presence of children under the age of 18. So um, folks, I was a bit ignorant in the beginning of doing this work that folks with families really face a ton of discrimination. And, and folks out there with children probably understand that intuitively. I do not have children myself, but um, you know, we see a lot of uh, steering of people in families uh, into first floor units because folks don't want to have uh, little feet running overhead or they steer families into a certain building in a complex just to have all the families together. The reality is that children can you know, have, you know, be disruptive and, and so on and so forth. And those folks need some protections to make sure their housing choice isn't limited uh, because they have families. So we can move on to the next slide. So we had some slide issues. Thank you, Claire. So um, coming back to, thank you. So when we think about the Fair Housing Act, um, you know, this was sort of opening the floodgates, so to speak, in a really positive way for a lot of civil rights legislation to get passed across the country. So different state protections and local protections began to be enacted. And you'll see um, as we move from left to right here, at the beginning of state in the Cook County columns, that the federally protected classes are also represented at these other levels of government. So those claims, if folks have been uh, faced discrimination and file and want to file a complaint, seek justice, can do that at these different levels of government. They don't just need to go to the federal government. So exempt, for example, in Illinois, we have those same protections as well as um, some different definitions like ancestry, which is sort of implied with national origin, but it's 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 explicitly made clear. It's also explicitly made clear that sexual orientation and gender identity are protected, and those were passed before the Supreme Court ruling that sort of implicitly protected those at the federal level. And if anything ever changed with the federal interpretations, that would continue to protect folks. Age discrimination is illegal in Illinois, but only for folks who are above the age of 40. A um, couple of random ones here won't go through all these. Pregnancy which is also sort of implied in family status, but again, it, when it's made explicit, it can be sort of a faster route to remedies. Source of income as of this year, as of January 1 of 2023, is protected across the state of Illinois, had previously been protected in Chicago for many years and in Cook County for about a decade. And source of income is a really important issue we're gonna talk about more later. So if you're not quite familiar with what that means, you will be soon. Um, I'm gonna highlight just a, a couple of these in Cook County. So you'll see some of the familiar ones, um, military status as well. That's also reflected at the state level as well as discharge status if you were dishonorably discharged from the military. Um, but a couple of really big ones, um, housing status is unique and important in our view. That would mean that the status of your current housing um, or really of your past housing, if you lived in a, a shelter for survivors of gender-based violence, if you've lived or currently living in a homeless shelter, if you're currently unhoused, um, you um, that you know the statute is intending to say you cannot be discriminated against for that status of your housing or that past status. Um, covered criminal history refers to a law called the Just Housing Amendment, um, which folks should really um, uh, you know get your coffee and and uh, get ready for the Just Housing Amendment because it's super important. It changes the way that we all, whether you're a tenant or a landlord need to conduct our business in Cook County, a really important law. So we'll be doing a deep dive on that later too. So we'll go to the next slide. So, you know, this is, I always kind of say too, like if one of the maybe top three things to take away from this, um, because this is about the lens with which we see discrimination. And this isn't just some arbitrary lens. These are legal theories that are held up in uh, courts of law in this country. So we think of this generally as two types of discrimination under the law. One being differential treatment. And that just means if I'm the offender, I'm treating somebody differently because of their protected class. Um, you know, if someone's just a jerk to everybody, they're an equal opportunity kind of mean person, that might not necessarily be great evidence for discrimination. But if they're um, engaging in a prohibited act because somebody is um, uh, of a protected class, that's when you have that differential treatment. So, you know, the example here, I won't rent to you because you're Muslim. Um, I'm gonna have you pay a uh, double the security deposit because you get a housing choice voucher known as section eight housing, um, which is protected. Or um, 
I'm going to harass you because of your sex um, or your gender identity. These, and, and, you know, it's a, a landlord tenant situation or even a neighbor to neighbor situation. Those can be, um, you know, shown and proven to be uh, treating somebody differently because of their protected class. Uh, disparate impact is a really important idea and can help us kind of spot discrimination and discriminatory outcomes in the real world where they may not be as obvious. And we can take legal action on these. So what did disparate impact, and we're gonna get a little, a little bit more of this when we talk about the Just Housing Amendment, but what it means is that a policy or practice might not be on its face discriminatory. It might not say something like some kind of, you know, racial prohibition or prohibition on people with disabilities or something where we can say, oh, okay, that's low hanging fruit. Yeah, that's, that's treating somebody differently. But the way the policy or practice plays out, it does have an impact on those prohibited, or excuse me, on those protected classes. So an example here, um, which directly applies to uh, the Just Housing Amendment is no felonies. So you can take this analysis though beyond the Just Housing Amendment in our local context to the national context. So say anywhere in this country, a housing provider that has a policy that says people with felonies cannot rent or purchase housing from our, our business. Well, people with felonies are not a protected class at the national level, at you know most state and local levels as well. So no, no discrimination, right? Well, if you look at statistics and you see that um, across the United States, people of color are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. That is because of, um, you know, the criminalization of people of color over policing and they're really the history of structural racism in this country. And um, also people with disabilities should be noted um, are vastly over overrepresented in um, jails and prisons as well. So you do have an impact on um, people who are in protected classes, disability and race. And therefore the policy may be able to be proven to have um, to be discriminatory under the Fair Housing Act. So I just like to you know, think about this in terms of outcomes, um, not looking at just process, but looking at the outcomes of what our policies are of private business and seeing, uh, you know, does that have a disparate impact on protected classes? And um, you know, does that qualify as, as a type of discrimination? So we can uh, talk more about that when we talk about the Just Housing Amendment. Let me move forward. So the, the Federal Housing Act is pretty explicit about different acts that it considers to be discriminatory. So steering, I mentioned a moment ago in passing about families, um, we used to you know, think a lot about steering and still do on the basis of race or national origin. So people of different um, you know, immigrant diasporas might be, um, you know, perhaps sometimes even, um, sometimes it's more nefarious and sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's, uh, oh, I just think maybe you'd be comfortable in this community or that you might enjoy living in this community with the sort of cultural amenities that it might have or different people um, of a particular ethnicity that you might find some sort of kinship bonds with. And, um, you know, that can limit choice. And especially when it's done to explicitly to, um, you know, uh, segregate communities. Um, just kind of skipping down randomly here to misrepresent the availability of housing. That one's pretty obvious. So I'm telling um, Claire that I do have a unit and I'm telling Catherine that I do not have the unit available and I'm lying because of the protected class of, of Catherine. That would be an example of uh, misrepresenting the availability of housing um, uh, in, in a prohibited way. So publishing discriminatory statements, that one's fairly obvious. You got a big banner that says, you know, no, um, nobody with vouchers here or, um, you know, Americans only, uh, that would be a discriminatory statement. And retaliating, uh, intimidating somebody for asserting their fair housing rights is uh, a prohibited act also. So we can go ahead and move forward. So there are some exemptions in the Fair Housing Act, just mention these briefly. Um, we won't do get into in the weeds on this because um, there are state and local laws that expand beyond this. This is just about the Federal Fair Housing Act. Uh, there's something known as the Mrs. Murphy exemption, which says that people who occupy their own homes, where there's a multi-unit, uh, or it could be multi-unit, it could just be one, but they're owner-occupied and they are four units or less, they are exempt from, um, from the Fair Housing Act 
So there are, uh, you know, there's a Civil Rights Act of 1866 that says that race and color, and I believe national origin are, um, are always uh, protected in forming contracts, and that includes in the housing context, again, local laws. Our, our own Cook County Human Rights Ordinance does not provide such an exemption. So, um, you know, this was something that was one to uh, get the law through, and um, there's a little bit of a, a hole in the protections that a lot of advocates feel like should be closed up. Um, there's some protections for housing for aging adults. Uh, that would be just from the familial status um, protections. So just to make that clear, there are certain ways that housing can be designated to be for people who are 55 and over, let's say. And that would just mean that they're not exempt from the Fair Housing Act as a whole, but that means that they do not have to accept families with children. Um, other exemptions for religious and private organizations, but they're very rarely met and are quite high barriers. Um, and there are some exemptions when there's a roommate in a shared living situation um, that would that would relate to things like sex, but of course people couldn't state things like racial preferences um, in those situations. So I won't get too much more in the weeds on that. It gets a little bit complicated, but um, uh, the Fair Housing Act applies, applies pretty broadly. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so can folks just type into the chat really quick, don't cheat, um, if you can remember uh, the seven federally protected classes. Let's just see if we can get some engagement from the folks who are here and folks who are watching this in the future can play along and see how many you can name. So looking to the chats, I'll start us off with Race, religion, we've got two, family status, three, age. Age is a great one. It is uh, protecting the state of Illinois. It is not a federal protection though. So race, religion, and family status are three of the seven at the federal level. I'm sorry if I was unclear about that. Yes, national origin is another one at the federal level. That's four. I'm going to help us with, yep, disability and religion and sex. Linda kind of closed out those, and I popped in disability. Those are the federal seven, just from the top. Race, religion, family status, national origin, sex, disability. Are we missing any, Claire? Wait, one, two, three. Oh, the only one we're missing is a little tricky, deeply related to race. Does anybody remember? I'll just tell you for the sake of time. Color, excellent, excellent work. Okay, moving on. So a little bit about disability. Go ahead and uh, move forward in the slide deck. So the definition of disability um, is, is a shared definition with the ADA. And it says a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities is a disability in the fair housing context. Um, she also note, also note that the perception of disability is covered under the Fair Housing Act and, and a lot of similar laws. So if you are not, in fact, disabled, but you're perceived to be disabled, you enjoy the same protections if you have been discriminated against. Also, the history of having a disability. If you were disabled, um, a lot of disabilities are permanent, but some are not. Um, the history of having disability is protected. And just while we're on this topic, this also extends to association, and that goes for any of the protected classes. So if I am um, a white person and um, I have uh, friends of color come to my unit and my landlord uh, happens to have uh, harbor racial animus and he takes um, adverse action against me, maybe tries to evict me or uh, some other kind of action harasses me because I associate with people of another race, um, I would still be protected under the Fair Housing Act to, um, you know, uh, uh, get remedies and be able to take action. So when it comes to disability, generally the Fair Housing Act prohibits landlords from asking whether you have a disability, about the severity of your disability, the history of it. That's protected medical information. But there are some contexts if you're requesting some kind of accommodation where you might need to show, um, you know, uh, some kind of evidence that you've got a disability. And we can talk about that next. Go ahead and move slides. So we talked about a, a reasonable accommodation and modification. So disability broadly is a 
protected class. You can't discriminate against somebody for having a disability. But there are, are additional um, ideas that came out of um, you know a lot of struggle um, that folks with disabilities not you know don't just need sort of a blanket um, protection at that sort of entry phase against disability and and the same protections against harassment and so on. But folks with disabilities often need have different needs to be able to fully enjoy their housing than folks uh, without disabilities. So if I'm in a wheelchair and the countertops are at um, you know a certain height, I'm not going to be able to cook. Um, my meals, if I have a policy where um, the rent is due on the first and I'm going to get a five day notice for not paying rent on the second, but I um, can, you know, only earn income from social security disability that comes on the seventh, I might need an accommodation to pay rent late. Or if um, I need a parking spot and I need a parking spot that's close to my unit. So these are all um, different kinds of accommodations or modifications that somebody would need to be able to fully enjoy and use their dwelling. Uh, an accommodation in, in the way the law speaks is an exception to a policy or practice that the housing provider has. So a no pets policy would need to be accommodated for somebody that has a service animal or an emotional support animal. Um, again, parking spaces would be an example. Again, to give that person the full use and enjoyment of that property. A modification is a physical change under fair housing law. Um, and there's a burden of cost here. Usually accommodations don't bear a lot of cost. Um, they can, you know, cost, uh, you know, some minor amounts to stripe up a, a parking lot, make it, maybe make a space accessible. But uh, a modification can be quite substantial if I need um, uh, a lift in my unit installed if I need uh, the countertops again lower the door widen my bathroom to be made accessible grab bars installed in the shower these kinds of things would have material costs and generally speaking in private housing when somebody requests a modification and it's reasonable it must be granted but the burden of paying for that is on the tenant in those cases there are many circumstances where it would be the burden of the housing provider to pay for it and that's generally going to be when the housing has some kind of federal dollars that are subsidizing it. So, um, you know, uh, folks who are in public housing, um, the Chicago Housing Authority and, and Housing Authority of Cook County's buildings, um, this does not extend to folks with housing choice vouchers, um, but, um, you know, when they're receiving direct uh, support from the federal government, that, that burden does shift. Can go to the next slide. So we're talking about reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications. Well, what does reasonable mean? This is always a tricky part of the law, right? So there are two buckets that have been established of, of how to assess whether something is reasonable or not under the law. And the two questions uh, fundamentally to ask are, are, one, does the request cause some kind of undue burden on the housing provider? And it's either a financial or an administrative burden. Does this just cost too much money for the housing provider to be able to foot this reasonable accommodation? Or the second question is, does it sort of fundamentally change the nature of the housing provider's business? The example I tend to give is if somebody had a mobility impairment and they were to inquire for the front desk person to be available to walk them from the front door of the building to their unit. Now, that might be a very kind thing to do. And uh, if there's a relationship there, perhaps it's even reasonable in, in that sort of social way. But in terms of, um, you know, the actual... Um, you know, job tasks of that employee, you know, they're generally not going to be you know, like additionally a, a home health aide or you know, have liability if they're if they're assisting somebody in a sort of medical capacity. So we would see that as prob probably changing the nature of, of the housing provider's business in a sort of fundamental way. So if these, you know, accommodation requests or modification requests are evaluated in this way, and they are really deemed to be unreasonable and that's substantiated. The housing provider is not really supposed to just drop off and say, okay, you don't get your accommodation or modification. They're supposed to engage in what's called the interactive process. And that just means that they're going to ask questions, try to meet the needs of that person still, not just sort of close the door on, on conversation. It's not a negotiation. It's not a way to try to figure out the least amount of action that the housing provider should take. It's a way to find if there's alternative methods to meet that person's needs 
and to get as close as you can to their initial request because the person with a disability, of course, knows that they need more than the housing provider. Can we move to the next slide? So um, always tricky questions when we come in to talk about service animals and emotional support animals, but really there's some pretty simple rules here and there's a lot of misunderstanding here. So broadly, the kind of distinction between a service animal and an emotional support animal is a service animal um, is typically a dog, um, can be a miniature horse, it's typically a dog that does work and it's trained to do some kind of work or tasks for a person with a disability. Um, typically an emotional support animal is there for symptom relief, a lot of really, really solid science that animals can help alleviate uh, anxiety, depression, have a whole other host of positive benefits for people with disabilities. And in both of these cases, an emotional support animal or a service animal, they're really seen the same under fair housing law. And a housing provider cannot require um, that there's an extra pet deposit or fee. Really, they're not uh, to be seen as pets at all. They're supposed to be seen as, um, you know, really um, an extension of the person or, uh, you know, just as any other kind of, um, you know, aid that a person would have, like a mobility device. Um, you know, I can't require additional insurance, uh, breed restrictions wouldn't apply, weight restrictions wouldn't apply to a service animal or an emotional support animal. And housing providers also can't take the side of other tenants that have unreasonable fears. They can enforce that, you know, the tenant's accountable for damage or for the animal, you know, destroying the unit, or if they do pose a threat and that's substantiated, of course, that, that can be, uh, that can come to bear on um, the reasonableness of, of that uh, assistance animal being allowed in the housing. But um, just note that a big, big misnomer, this is maybe in the top three or four things to take away here as well, big flag, assistance animals of either kind do not need any special certification or training to be allowed to be an emotional support animal or a service animal. And in fact, you cannot, cannot require that the person have any specific certification or training to be um, uh, allowed in that housing to be considered either one of those types of assistance animals. So, you know, you might think that there's the agenda setting uh, best certification, it's Illinois assistance animals certificate, doesn't matter. A person can train their own pet. They can train, or excuse me, their own assistance animal. Uh, to do work for them in the case of a service animal or to kind of provide them symptom relief. That doesn't really take any training in a lot of cases. Um, little tenant tip here just for folks who have, you know, gotten a situation where there's accusations of the animal, you know, uh, you know, having a lot of wear and tear on the unit or, you know, um, causing other kind of damage. Make sure you document, document, document on that piece. Um, go forward to the next slide. So documentation, this is an important question. So this is where, you know, I was speaking about before, there can be situations where a housing provider can reasonably ask for documentation for the animal. Um, that would be in situations where the disability is not readily apparent. That's what the HUD guidance says. So if the disability is readily apparent, and HUD has some guidance you can read on this, be happy to send out um, after the presentation. You know, if, if someone clearly is visually impaired and they have uh, an animal that helps them um, to guide, if um, they're, you know, uh, have other, some other kind of disability that's, that's really clear, you're really not supposed to ask any questions at all. And you're supposed to accept that they uh, need that uh, accommodation. If they don't have a readily apparent disability, which many disabilities, of course, are not readily apparent. They can be asked for some kind of um, documentation, and HUD has said that uh, a reliable form would be from someone's healthcare professional. They've also said that third-party service providers can also provide this kind of verification that the person has a disability. And, and what that documentation should say is that the person has a disability under the Fair Housing Act, um, that they that disability qualifies as a disability under the Fair Housing Act that um, the accommodation that they are seeking is related to that disability um, so that there's a nexus. That's what we always say there. There needs to be a nexus between what's being requested and the disability itself. It can't just be, well, um, you know, I'm in a wheelchair, so I need the dog. It's like, okay, well, how does the dog relate to the, to the, to the mobility needs or to some other element of the disability? So, you know, when we're 
advising clients to make sure that um, the documentation is thorough. If the house, if the medical provider or third party service provider, you know, does want to provide that, um, it needs to have, of course, their name, what the relationship is with the patient, um, the type of animal, or if it's not an animal, it can, this can apply to other types of accommodations, you know, what type of um, accommodation is being sought and what is the relationship between the disability and the need if that is not apparent. You can go ahead and the next slide. And I think, oh, we have a quick case study. Just given time here, I want to get through some other material in Claire's section. Claire, why don't we go ahead and save the case studies for now? And I'm going to let um, Claire, my colleague, do source of income and the Just Housing Amendment. And I'll take questions. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me right yes. now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so far we've kind of talked about some of the more national protections under the Fair Housing Act, and now we're going to get into some of the more state and local protections available to us all. So the first one that we want to talk about is the protected class of source of income. So source of income is a protected class in Cook County. It has been since 2013, and it's also a protected class in the state of Illinois, um, which it has been since officially since January 1st, 2023. So this is a protection that is new statewide. Um, that is something that folks fought really, really hard for, that organizers organized around to make sure that we have this really, really crucial, important protection available to us. So when we talk about why source of income protections are so important and so crucial to us, um, they are so important because they prohibit source of income discrimination. Um, so what we talk, what we mean when we talk about source of income discrimination is we are talking about the practice by which a housing provider or a landlord might refuse to rent to somebody, might alter the terms of the lease, um, might provide some type of differential treatment um, to a tenant or an applicant who's trying to pay their rent using legal non-wage income. Um, so source of income discrimination is something that we see a lot within our service area, um, especially against housing choice voucher holders, um, but it also happens against other folks who are paying their rent using non-wage income. So we can talk a little bit about just different types of income types. Um, so when we talk about legal non-wage income, what we're really talking about is income that is not necessarily employment-based. So income that's not coming from wages. And source of income protections are here so that everyone's income, regardless of whether the wages come from employment, is treated as just as valid, just as equal way of paying rent. Um, so some different examples of different kinds of legal non-wage income are rental assistance, housing choice vouchers, SSI or SSDI payments, FASH vouchers, which are a voucher that veterans can get to support them in their housing, and then child support, other forms of assistance, and says temporary assistance for needy families, any of these other kinds of non-wage income that may be used to either pay rent, such as a housing choice voucher, or supplement rent. Um, you might use TANF for child support to supplement your other income to pay your rent. And under source of income protections, all income must be treated equally and as a valid way of paying your rent. So under source of income protections, we just listed out a couple of ways in which housing discrimination might look on the ground and some examples of discriminatory acts. Um, so one example being treating voucher holders different than other tenants. So maybe offering a higher security deposit to someone with a housing choice voucher saying, hmm, like maybe not necessarily saying we're not gonna rent to you, but saying in order to rent here, if you have a voucher, you have to pay more for security deposit than other tenants who are paying their wage, their rent using employment-based wages. Um, another example could be just flat out refusing to rent to somebody who's paying their rent using not wage income. So statements such as we don't take full rent. We don't take section eight. These are statements that are discriminatory acts under source of income protections. Um, another example could be intentionally delaying the processing of some of the application simply because they're paying their rent using non-wage income. So in the fair housing world, a lot of times we say delay is tantamount with denial because if you take some application, you're just letting it sit there until 
a different applicant comes in, um, a lot of times that person who applied with the voucher or other form of income is missing out on that housing opportunity. So these are just some examples of what source of income discrimination could look like. Um, it's really important to note that for housing choice vouchers, um, if landlords are going to apply three times the rent ratios, rent to income ratios, they must consider the portion that the voucher holder um, subsidy pays for. Um, so say if you're looking at an apartment, you have a housing choice voucher, the landlord has a three times the rent requirement and income to rent requirement. Um, and it's telling you, hey, like you need to make three times the rent in order to live here. They must take that $1,000 that your subsidy pays for into account. So instead of being on the hook for 1,500 times three, you will be on the hook for that $500 of the rent that you will be paying that's not covered by the subsidy. So that was source of income protections. Um, next, we're gonna talk about the covered conviction history, which is a protected class in Cook County under the Just Housing Amendment. So really quick, just at a federal level, just zooming out a little bit, um, HUD has offered official guidance on criminal history discrimination. Um, so HUD has recognized that the criminal legal system disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, disproportionately impacts individuals with disabilities, also disproportionately impacts LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and so they have stated and put out guidance that if a landlord or housing provider is going to use a blanket ban, such as no felonies against folks with criminal records, that landlord is putting themselves at risk of violating the Federal Fair Housing Act and having future action taken against them. Um, so this is at a federal level. Um, at a countywide level, we have much, much stronger protections under the Just Housing Act. Amendment, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But really quick, we're just going to set the stage for why these protections are so important. Um, so as you see on the slides, one in three people in the United States has a conviction record. So this is not something that is unique or uncommon. It's actually pretty common to have a conviction record or a criminal record within the United States. And this is because of the ways in which the U.S incarcerates folks at much higher rates than any other country in the entire world. Um, so as you can see, once you have a record, it's very, it can be very, very hard to access housing. So you'll see that 80% of people with prior justice system involvement have been denied history because of their own or because of a loved one's conviction history. And then if we're looking at Chicago alone, you have about 11,000 individuals returning each year from Illinois prisons. So if you zoom out to Cook County, where the Just Housing Amendment is applicable, this translates to over 1 million people in need of housing protections at the countywide level. So the Just Housing Amendment was like really, really groundbreaking legislation, to be honest. Um, and it went into effect in January 2020 throughout Cook County. This is also something that advocates and folks impacted by incarceration fought really hard for as well. Um, and just we can give kind of a quick summary of what the Just Housing Amendment protects, kind of what it looks like on the ground. Um, first thing to note about the JHA is that under the Just Housing Amendment, landlords in Cook County cannot ask you about your criminal background before you apply. And even once you are applying, they can't run a background check until a very specific moment in the screening process, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Landlords also cannot consider arrests, charges, citations at any point in time. So it doesn't matter if it was 10 years ago, it doesn't matter if it was one year ago, last week, um, they can't consider any arrests, charges, or citations at all um, when making a decision around someone's housing and whether to apply, um, not to apply, whether to approve or deny somebody. Landlords also cannot consider sealed, expunged, or pardoned records. They can't consider juvenile records from any point in time. Um, so even if you are maybe 19, you had a conviction from when you were 17, um, they cannot consider that, even though that is within the three-year look-back period. 
Um, and then this last piece, landlords cannot consider convictions older than three years old when making decisions around whether to approve or deny somebody housing. Um, and this is with two narrow exceptions around convictions related to sex offenses. Um, so for any other conviction, so it doesn't matter if it's a felony, doesn't matter if it's a violent offense, any conviction that's older than three years old, as long as it's not one of those two exceptions involving sex offenses, um, landlords cannot consider that in their decision and whether to approve or deny you from housing. And then this last piece right here, um, if your conviction is within the three-year look-back period, so it's not older than three years old, a landlord can consider it, but they have to go through an individualized assessment before denying your application. So they can't say, oh, any conviction within three years is an automatic denial. Um, that is illegal under the Just Housing Amendment. So kind of what makes in addition to those protections that we just talked about, what makes the Just Housing Amendment so groundbreaking is it really changes the entire screening process for all landlords throughout Cook County. Um, so it completely changes the application process and when they can run a background check. Um, it doesn't just apply to when dealing with folks with a record, this applies to when any individual applies to your housing. Um, so step one in the screening process, so you have someone who has applied for the housing with you. The landlord can do their typical screening process. So they can check the applicant's credit history. They can check their employment, income, get landlord references, whatever is part of their standard tenant screening process. This is what they would do in step one. But they cannot run a background check in step one. So what they have to do is they have to pre-qualify the applicant before running a background check. So once they've done this standard screening process, they have to offer a written pre-approval notice to the applicant before moving to step two. So once you've gotten that written pre-approval notice, then the landlord can run your background check. And so when running the background check, landlords can only consider convictions or criminal history from the last three years. So any convictions older than those three year look back period, they cannot consider it. Um, and in addition to this, the applicant has a right to have a copy of the report sent to them within five days of the landlord receiving it. And then you also must be given an additional five days to dispute any inaccuracies in the background check, um, provide any mitigating context around the circumstances that led to your conviction, um, anything like that. So you must be given that additional five days to dispute any of that evidence. Um, so then after step two, then the landlord can move on to step three, which is the individualized assessment, um, where they must take into account everything that the tenant has provided them with um, in terms of any mitigating evidence or context or any inaccuracies that they disputed, um, and then use the individualized assessment to make their final decision around whether they're going to approve somebody or deny somebody. And if they do move to deny somebody after doing the individualized assessment, they have to let that person know in writing an explanation of why their application was denied. So just some questions that can go into an individualized assessment. Really what the point and focus of an individualized assessment is, is it's really to get housing providers to think about is whatever the person did, whatever's on their background, is that really relevant to their tenancy? Um, and are they able to fulfill the responsibilities of their tenancy? Um, so they might ask questions such as, what is the nature of the individual sentencing? Maybe how many convictions does the person have? Has there been any evidence of rehabilitation? Um, so sometimes people will provide letters of recommendation from friends and family or from employers to kind of show that they have moved on from their conviction and that their conviction does not define them as a person. Um, other questions they might ask are things as such as, what is the relevance of the conviction to the tenancy? So it's really important that before denying any applicant, um, the landlord must go through this individualized assessment for someone. So there are, as we were talking about, a few exceptions in the JHA. Um, and this is for applicants who are currently required to register under the Sex Offender Registration Act, 
or if the applicant is currently under residential restrictions um, because they are a current quote unquote child sex offender. Um, so in those instances, even if your conviction is older than three years old, older than that three year look back period, landlords can still consider those two offenses. Um, and then there are some exceptions around federally subsidized housing. So if an applicant is currently using illegal drugs as a prior eviction related to drug related activity within the past three years, or if they've manufactured methamphetamine in subsidized housing, um, a landlord who is part of federally subsidized housing would be able to consider that. So we've kind of talked about all these different protections at both the federal level, state level, countywide level, um, but kind of we haven't talked a lot about kind of what can you do if you've experienced these violations? Kind of where can you go for support if you've experienced housing discrimination. So we've listed out different fair housing organizations all across Chicagoland. Um, this list can look a little bit overwhelming. It's a lot of different contacts right now. Um, just important to know is that Open Communities is the fair housing organization that operates in the north and northwest suburbs of the Cook County. So Mount Prospect is within our service area if you have experienced a fair housing violation, or even if you think you might have experienced housing discrimination, even if you're not really sure, but you have just maybe a feeling that something funny might have went on. Um, you can reach out to us. If you're outside of our service area, we will always, always connect folks with our partner organizations, um, that, such as the ones listed on the slide. And when coming to open communities, sometimes I feel like a barrier to getting support is sometimes questions around what support might look like for people. Um, so we like to let people know that support is client-centered. So you're in the driver's seat, you get to decide what feels best for you. Um, but just some examples of ways we can support are through direct advocacy with the housing provider who may have been in violation of your fair housing rights. We can also support with investigating that housing provider further. So we can use fair housing testing to gather additional evidence of discrimination to kind of support you in building up a stronger case. Um, we can also support with just understanding the options available to you when filing a complaint or taking further action. Um, so we can support with that process of filing a complaint. We can also support with you know, letting folks know, like if you do file a complaint, what are some remedies available to you and kind of what to expect. Um, so yeah, those are just some, some ways we can support, but again, it really just depends on kind of what clients want to see happen when they come to us with complaints of discrimination. And just some quick tips around kind of what to look out for, kind of what details to collect if you're out there looking for housing and you're concerned around potential fair housing violations. Some details you can collect that are helpful when making complaint are details such as information about the name of the person you spoke to, um, the date and time when the violation might have occurred, the address of that housing that you're trying to get into, um, any ads, emails, texts, any kind of documentation around any discriminatory actions are helpful and useful. And then we just have a quick little slide around the process of filing a complaint. Um, you can file a complaint with the Cook County Commission on Human Rights. They have a very, very open-ended complaint form um, where you just have like a space and it says just add facts that support your claim. You can attach an addendum to any of these complaints with any of that screenshot evidence, um, any information around what had occurred. We, of course, are always here to support people um, with figuring out what to include in their complaint. Um, so that is something that we are definitely here actively working with folks to do. Um, and in addition to IDHR or CCHR, you could also file a complaint with Illinois Department of Human Rights. So their complaint form is a little bit more guided, ask some specific questions around the specific incident, where it happened, what happened. Um, so it's a little bit more guided, but again, we are always here as a resource and a support um, to help folks with filing complaints. And then let's talk about possible remedies. Um, so kind of what 
could happen, what could be outcomes from filing a complaint, from taking further action. Um, so it's important to note that when you're filing a complaint with the Illinois Department of Human Rights, you only have one year to file from the last discriminatory act. Um, so that's something that we like to let people know just so that they know kind of that there is that timeline, unfortunately, that they are on. Um, and the timeline for the Cook County Commission on Human Rights is 180 days. So six months to file since the last discriminatory act. Um, and we always let folks know that the system is imperfect. It can sometimes take time to get remedies, but there are real remedies and positive outcomes that can come from taking further action when you experience discrimination. Um, so under the Cook County Commission on Human Rights, some potential remedies are damages um, for that emotional injury, damages for loss, damages for the harm caused. Um, so this can look like actual monetary compensation coming to you. Um, there can also be punitive damages levied against the housing provider who's been in violation. Um, it can cover attorney's fees. Um, also, you may receive injunctive relief, which is sometimes a court order to maybe order something to happen, such as ordering the housing provider to let you into housing or ordering a housing provider to change a certain practice or procedure, something like that. And then when filing with IDHR, there's similar remedies that are available to folks. Um, it's just important to note that punitive damages are much, much higher um, at the statewide level, um, which is really a good thing because it's, you know, in preventing future incidents from happening, these punitive damages are very, very powerful. So here are just different contact information, one for open communities, and then for HUD, IDHR, and Cook County Commission on Human Rights, um, the different links for filing a complaint. And that is the end of our content. Um, so thank you guys so, so much for sticking in there with us, um, for learning some more about your fair housing rights. And I think we have some time for questions now. So I will hand it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Claire and Dominic. That was so much information. You covered so much. Thank you. I, I know I definitely learned a lot. <laughs> Um, we don't currently have any questions in the chat, so we'll just wait a couple moments for people to have a chance to put any that they're ruminating on thinking about in the chat. Um, I do want to make a shout out to um, something that Dominic put in the chat. If you are interested in becoming a fair housing tester, which is an undercover fair housing agent, um, contact Open Communities if you're interested or have any questions about that or what that entails. You can let them know. Um, just wait a few more moments. If you have a question that you'd prefer to unmute and ask it, that's totally cool. Oh, and um, sorry. I have a question. Hmm? Uh, I'm interested in the the te being a tester, but I don't have. I'm not working right now. I'm currently a student, so it would it wouldn't be an option for me, right? No, as long as you are 18, and they're actually um, really really flexible time commitments. So basically, what happens is. Um, if you're interested in being a fair housing tester, we, of course, want to have a quick conversation, make sure that your values are aligned with you know, anti-discrimination and the things that we believe in at, at uh, Open Communities, make sure you're a good fit. There are some um, narrative reporting kind of things you have to do for uh, tests, but really, it's really flexible. We have testers who test once a month. We have testers who test once every three months, and that could just mean making a phone call and then writing some reporting about your experience. And in that phone call, you'd, of course, be pretending to be somebody else. Your name would be slightly changed. And um, sometimes it could be going to do what we call a site visit and actually going to, let's say, a property manager's office or to view a unit or to, you know, see a home from a real estate agent. And um, all these opportunities are paid as well. So testers get paid $50 per, uh, excuse me, phone test and $100 per site visit. We're going to also expand to do more advanced testing types like um, checking for that new construction is designed to accessibility standards and also making sure that lenders are um, not being discriminatory in the way that they um, uh, pre-approve people for mortgages and things of that nature, which will have higher uh, payments attached to them. So um, some great opportunities. You can just email me if you want to take down my email here. 
um, just dominic at open-communities.org. Um, the email right below that is for Kenya, our um, uh, test coordinator, kbarbara at opencommunities.org. If you even want to include both of us on an email, um, and we can send out this information, so don't feel rushed to like write it all down right now. But um, you can contact us. We'll have a quick conversation. We can get you trained up, and you can test kind of as much or as little as you like. Awesome. Any Thank you. Sorry. Go. No, no, no. I was just going to say thank you for that question. That was a really good question. Um, and thank you, Dominic, for, for explaining all of that. I'm just going to check the chat one last time. No other questions. Um, so we'll just give it another second or two. Okay, doesn't seem like it. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, you had great questions and this was a great presentation. Obviously, people will want to refer back to and will be on our YouTube page. Um, so thank you so much, Dominic and Claire. This was really great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody who came. And please do, um, you know, can we, we'll follow up. Oh, yeah. If you have any questions about testing, any questions about other, you know, I know a lot of the laws, a lot of the laws that we talked about tonight are complex. We did it pretty fast. So we're always happy to consult if you have questions, especially if you're a housing provider and you want to make sure that you are following the law. We really enjoy those kind of calls. So it's not like we're sort of looking to, um, you know, to, to find something to persecute you on. We really want folks to be compliant. So always feel free to check in and um, interested in volunteering, anything like that, just reach out. All right. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a good night. Take care, everybody. Bye.